Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I want to start our time together with a story, something that happened to me many years ago. It's a story about a lesson I learned, one that has stayed with me ever since. I remember walking through a beautiful garden. This garden was filled with the most splendid flowers and trees I had ever seen. As I walked, I came across an old gardener. He was tending to the plants with such care and attention. I stopped and watched him for a moment. And then I asked him, how do you make this garden so beautiful? He stopped what he was doing, looked up at me with a smile and said, it's simple, really. You take care of the plants every day. You water them, you make sure they get enough sun and you remove the weeds that can choke their growth. Do this consistently and the garden flourishes. That simple conversation in that beautiful garden taught me a profound lesson. Just like the gardener tends to his plants, we must tend to our habits. It's our daily habits that shape our lives, that determine whether we flourish like those plants or whether we wither. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the habits of highly successful people. These aren't complicated secrets or inaccessible strategies. They are simple, everyday choices that can lead you towards a life of extraordinary success. Just like the gardener in his garden, we have the power to cultivate our habits, to nurture them, and to watch as they transform our lives. As we explore these habits, I invite you to think of your own life as a garden. What are you planning? What are you nurturing? And what needs to be weeded out? Let's embark on this journey together, discovering the habits that can lead us to the success we desire and deserve. We begin with our first habit, the goal setting and vision. Think of a ship setting out to sea. Before it leaves the harbor, it needs a destination, a course to navigate. Without this, the ship would drift aimlessly at the mercy of the winds and the waves. Much like that ship, we too need a destination in our lives. Our goals? I once met a young man full of energy and ambition. He told me, I want to be successful. I want to make something of my life. I asked him, what are your goals? What's your destination? He paused, unsure. You see, he, he had the desire, but not the direction. This is where the power of clear goals comes into play. Successful people don't leave their futures to chance. They set specific, clear goals. They know exactly what they want, whether it's in their careers, their personal lives, or their health. But setting these goals is just the first step. What really brings these goals to life is the vision that accompanies them. Vision is about seeing the future before it happens. It's about painting a picture in your mind of where you want to go, what you want to achieve. It's not just about saying, I want to be successful. It's about defining what success looks like for you. Is it starting your own business? Is it writing a book? Is it making a difference in your community? Let me tell you, the power of a well-defined vision is incredible. It's like a magnet pulling you towards your goals. When you have a clear vision, every effort, every struggle becomes meaningful because you know where you're headed. Why do you cultivate this habit? Start by asking yourself some key questions. What are my deepest desires? What does my ideal future look like? Write these down, make them vivid, and visit them regularly. Let this vision guide you, inspire you, and keep you aligned with your purpose. Remember, like the ship setting out to sea, you need a destination, set your goals, paint your vision, and start your journey towards that horizon. Now, let's turn our attention to our second habit, continuous learning and growth. Imagine for a moment a tree. When it stops growing, what happens? It starts to die. The same principle applies to the day we stop growing, learning, and improving is the day we start to stagnate. I recall a conversation I had with an old friend who was a successful entrepreneur. I asked him, what's the secret to your success? He replied, I never stop learning. Every day I learn something new and that keeps me ahead. His word struck a chord with me. Successful people are perpetual learners. They read books, they listen to podcasts, they attend workshops and seminars. They understand that knowledge is not just power. It is the fuel for their journey to success. But continuous learning is more than just absorbing information. It's about expanding your understanding, challenging your perspectives, and applying what you learn. It's about growing, not just in knowledge, but in wisdom and insight. It's about becoming a better version of yourself day by day. How do you cultivate this habit? Start by setting aside time every day for learning. 
It doesn't have to be long. Even just 15 minutes a day can make a difference. Read a book, listen to an audio book, watch a documentary, or even have a deep conversation with someone who inspires you. The key is to remain curious, to keep asking questions, and to never assume you know it all. Remember, like the tree, our growth is continuous. As long as we're learning, we're growing. And as long as we're growing, we're moving closer to our fullest potential. Let's now consider our third habit, time management and productivity. Picture time as a currency, the most valuable currency we have. Unlike money, when it's gone, you can't earn more. How we spend our time, therefore, is crucial to our I remember meeting a wise old man once who said to me, each day is a gift of 24 hours. How you spend it is up to you. Spend it wisely and it will pay you back in success and achievement. This simple yet profound advice highlights the essence of time management. Successful people understand that time is finite. They don't waste it on things that don't align with their goals. They are masters of prioritization, focusing on tasks that move them closer to their visions. They are disciplined, often following routines that maximize their productivity. They understand that every minute counts. But it's not just about being busy. It's about being productive. There's a difference between activity and accomplishment. The key is to focus on high impact tasks, those that bring you closer to your goals, and delegate or eliminate tasks that don't serve your purpose. How do we cultivate this habit? Start by evaluating how you currently spend your time. Identify the time wasters and distractions. Set clear priorities each day and stick to them. Learn to say no to things that don't align with your goals. And remember, productivity is not about filling every moment with work. It's about making each moment count. As we manage our time wisely, we find that we can achieve more with less stress and more fulfillment. Time, after all, is the canvas on which we paint the masterpiece of our lives. Let's now explore our fourth habit, perseverance and resilience. Think of the mighty oak tree. It starts as a small acorn, faces countless storms, and yet it grows tall and strong. Its strength lies not in its size, but in its ability to withstand the challenges that nature throws its way. Similarly, the path to success is often strewn with obstacles but it is our perseverance and resilience that see us through. I recall a story of a famous writer who was rejected by publishers over and over again. Each rejection was a storm, a test of his resolve, but he didn't give up. He kept writing, kept improving. Eventually, he became one of the most celebrated authors of his time. His story is a testament to the power of not giving in to defeat. Perseverance is about staying the course, even when the going gets tough. It's about commitment to your goals, no matter the hurdles. Resilience, on the other hand, is about bouncing back from setbacks. It's about learning from failures, not letting them define you. How do we build these qualities? Start by embracing challenges as opportunities for growth. When you face a setback, ask yourself, what can I learn from this? Develop a positive attitude towards failure. See it as a stepping stone, not a stumbling block. And most importantly, keep your eyes on your goals. Let your vision be stronger than your fears and doubt. Remember, the journey to success is not a sprint. It's a marathon. It requires patience, endurance, and the will to keep going when things get tough. Like the oak tree, let your roots of perseverance and resilience run deep and you will find the strength to overcome any storm. As we navigate further into our exploration of the habits of highly successful people, let us turn our attention to a critical yet often overlooked aspect. Networking and relationships, picture if you will, a tapestry. Each thread in this tapestry represents a relationship, a connection. Individually, they might seem insignificant, but woven together, they create a work of strength, beauty, and utility. In much the same way, our relationships and networks intertwine to form the fabric of our professional and personal lives, offering support, strength, and opportunities. I remember an old story about a young man who started his career with nothing but ambition and a willingness to learn. He wasn't born into privilege, nor did he have extraordinary talents, but he had one remarkable quality. He knew the value of building relationships. 
He treated everyone he met, from the janitor to the CEO, with respect and genuine interest. Over time, he built a network of connections that played a pivotal role in his eventual success. His story illustrates a powerful truth. Success is not just about what you know, but also about who you know. Networking is not merely a business tactic. It is an art form. It's about building genuine connections, sharing ideas, and offering value to others. It's not about handing out business cards at events. It's about forging lasting relationships based on trust and mutual respect. Successful people understand this. They invest time in nurturing their relationships, understanding that these connections are crucial to their personal and professional growth. But how do we cultivate this habit? First and foremost, uh, approach networking with a mindset of giving, not just receiving. Ask yourself, how can I help rather than what can I gain? Be genuinely interested in others. Listen to their stories, understand their needs, and offer help where you can. Remember, the strongest relationships are built on a foundation of genuine care and value. Another key aspect is the role of mentors. Mentors are like the experienced captains who help navigate our ships through uncharted waters. They provide guidance, share wisdom, and help us avoid pitfalls. Seek out mentors who inspire you, who have walked the path you wish to tread, be open to their advice, and equally be willing to mentor others. In teaching, we often reinforce our own learning and growth. Networking and relationship building also extend beyond professional life. It's about being part of a community, about forming bonds that enrich our lives. It involves family, friends, and even strangers who might one day become friends. Each person we meet has something unique to offer, a lesson to teach, a perspective to share. Cherish these interactions, for they are the threads that strengthen the tapestry of your life. In a world that's becoming increasingly digital, don't forget the power of personal interaction. A face-to-face -face conversation, a handshake, a shared experience, these are the things that forge strong bonds. In your journey to success, take the time to build and nurture these connections. Attend events, join groups, participate in community activities, be present and engaged. It's also important to remember that networking is a two-way street. It requires effort and reciprocity. As you build your network, be reliable, be trustworthy, and most importantly, be yourself. Authenticity is the cornerstone of any meaningful relationship. As we journey further into the exploration of the habits of highly successful people, it's crucial to address a fundamental aspect often overshadowed by ambition and achievement health and well-being. Picture your body and mind as a temple. Just a temple requires care and reverence. Our bodies and minds demand respect and attention. This is not a luxury. It is a necessity. The state of our health directly impacts our ability to achieve success and enjoy its fruits. I recall, recall a conversation with a very successful businessman. He had wealth, respect, and power, but his health was failing. He said to me, I spent the first half of my life sacrificing my health to gain wealth, and now I am spending my wealth to regain my health. His words are a poignant reminder that neglecting our health in the pursuit of success is like building a mansion on quicksand. The habit of maintaining good health involves more than just avoiding illness. It's about cultivating a lifestyle that enhances our physical, mental, and emotional well-being. It's about nourishment not just of the body, but of the soul. Let's start with physical health. Our bodies are the vehicles that carry us through our journey of success. How we treat them determines how far they can take us. This means regular exercise, a balanced diet, and adequate rest. Exercise doesn't just strengthen the body, it clears the mind. It's not about having a perfect physique. It's about maintaining a level of fitness that allows energy and vitality to flow through you. And then there's nutrition. The food we consume is the fuel for our bodies. Imagine if you had a luxury car, would you fill it with low-grade fuel? Of course not. Then why do we often neglect the quality of what we put into our own bodies? Eating well is not about strict diets or deprivation. It's about balance and nourishing ourselves in a way that supports our overall well-being. Rest, too, is vital. It's the time when our bodies repair and rejuvenate. In our fast-paced world, 
Sleep is often sacrificed for productivity, but this is a false economy. Lack of rest diminishes our effectiveness and clouds our judgment. A well-rested mind is more creative, more alert, and more capable of problem solving. Now let's talk about mental and emotional health. Our mind is like a garden, just as a garden requires regular tending to prevent the weeds from taking over. Our minds require care to stay healthy and resilient. This includes managing stress, fostering positive thoughts, and engaging in activities that bring joy and relaxation. It's also about surrounding ourselves with people who uplift us, who challenge us in positive ways, and who support our mental health. It's not just the absence of mental illness. It's about cultivating a state of well-being where we feel capable, confident, and balanced. This includes practices like mindfulness, meditation, or simply taking time to reflect and be present. Remember, success is not just measured by what we achieve, but by how we feel and how we live. Our health is the foundation upon which we build the edifice of our achievements. Neglect it, and everything else becomes meaningless. As we explore further into the habits of highly successful people, we must turn our attention to an aspect that often defines much of our adult lives, financial wisdom. Consider for a moment the process of building a house. You wouldn't start with the roof or the walls. You start with the foundation, ensuring it's solid, stable, and able to support everything you build upon it. Similarly, in the realm of success, financial wisdom serves as a foundation. It's about building a stable base upon which all other achievements can rest. I remember a story of a young entrepreneur I once met. He had big dreams and endless ambition. In his rush to success, he overlooked the basics of financial management. He earned plenty, but he also spent just as much, sometimes even more. Eventually, his financial recklessness caught up with him and his dreams crumbled. It was a hard lesson in the importance of financial prudence. Financial wisdom is not just about making money. It's about managing it effectively. It's about understanding the value of saving, the power of investing, and the danger of debt. It's about making your money work for you not you working endlessly for your money. The first step in cultivating financial wisdom is to live within your means. It's easy to get caught up in the trappings of success, the latest gadgets, the fanciest cars, the luxurious holidays, but true wealth is not in outward display. It's in financial security and freedom. Next is the art of saving and investing. The goal here is not to amass wealth for wealth's sake, but to create a buffer against life's uncertainties and to build resources that allow you to seize opportunities. Learn the basics of investing, not to become a speculator, but to understand how to grow your wealth wisely. Another crucial aspect is budgeting. It's about knowing where your money goes and making conscious decisions about spending. A budget is not a constraint. It's a tool for making informed financial choices, a roadmap that guides your financial decisions. Let's also talk about debt. In today's world, it's easy to fall into the trap of buying now and paying later. But debt is like quicksand. The more you struggle without a plan, the deeper you sink. Learn to use debt wisely as a tool, not as a means to fund an unsustainable lifestyle. Financial wisdom also extends to investing in yourself. This means your education, your skills, and your personal growth. Sometimes the best investment you can make is in your own potential. In closing, remember that financial wisdom is not inherent. It's learned. It's a habit that can be developed through discipline, education, and a mindful approach to money, like building a house. Start with the foundation. Build it strong, and it will support your dreams, your goals, and your success for a lifetime. As we draw our time together to a close, let's take a moment to reflect on the journey we've embarked upon this evening. We've explored the habits of highly successful people, not as distant concepts, but as tangible, achievable practices that each of us can incorporate into our lives. Think back to the gardener and his garden that we talked about at the beginning. Just as the gardener tends to his garden, nurturing it every day, so too must we tend to the garden of our habits. We talked about the importance of setting clear goals and having a vision, much like a ship setting its course. We delved into the power of continuous learning and growth. 
reminding ourselves that like a tree, we must keep growing to stay alive. We discuss the precious nature of time, understanding that like a currency, once spent, it can never be regained. We embrace the idea of perseverance and resilience, learning to stand strong like the mighty oak tree amidst the storms of challenges and setbacks. We recognize the significance of networking and relationships, seeing them as threads in the tapestry of our success. We acknowledge the paramount importance of health and well-being, treating our body and mind as the temple that houses our spirit and ambition. And finally, we talked about financial wisdom, understanding that like a strong foundation, it supports and sustains all other aspects of our lives. As we part ways tonight, I urge you to think of these habits not just as guidelines for success, but as stepping stones on a path to a more fulfilled, more purposeful life. Remember, the journey to success is not a race. It's a marathon. It requires patience, dedication, and most importantly, a willingness to take that first step and then to keep on walking step by step, day by day. Excuse me. Life parting words to you are these. Believe in yourself, believe in your ability to change, to grow and to achieve. The seeds of greatness lie within each of us. It's up to us to nurture them, to water them, to give them the light of our attention and the nourishment of our efforts. As you leave here tonight, carry with you not just the memory of our conversation, but the commitment to take action. Start with one habit, one change, one small step, and then Watch as your garden grows, as your life transforms, and as you become the architect of your own destiny. Now, in illustrating personal development, uh, Mr. Schof, my teacher, started with uh, money. You know, money is not the only place to start in talking personal development, but it's where he started. So uh, let me share the thoughts he shared with me back then. Let me share them with you. Here's the best lesson I can give you on economics. It's very simple. We get paid for bringing value to the marketplace. That's about as simple as I can put economics. Uh, we get paid for bringing value to the marketplace now. It takes time to bring value to the marketplace. However, we do not get paid for time. So we cross that out mistakenly. The man says, I'm making about $20 for an hour. How true. If that was true, you could just stay home, right? And have them send your money. So that's not true. We don't get paid for time. We get paid for value brought to the marketplace. Now, since that's true, here's one of the key questions of my talk to you today. Is it possible to become twice as valuable to the marketplace and make twice as much money in the same time? Is that possible? The answer is yes. Could you become three times as valuable as you might be right now to the marketplace and make three times as much money in the same time? And the answer is yes, five, ten times. Of course, America is unique. It's a uh, ladder starts down here, let's say at $5 an hour, and it keeps going up. Top income last year, $80 million. The guy who runs Coca-Cola. Now that's a heck of a ladder. That's why everybody wants to come here, right? The boat people are not headed for Vietnam. People have been plotted and schemed for 50 years, saying if I could just get to Poland, everything would be okay, not true. Everybody wants to come to America. And the reason is because we've got the best wind ever blowing in our favor. We've got the best economic opportunity anybody's had in 6,000 years. And all you have to do is understand it and take advantage of it. Now, there's some key questions to ask here. Why would the marketplace pay someone only $5 an hour? Very simple answer. They're not very valuable to the marketplace. Now we must underline to the marketplace. This person might be a very valuable brother. Yes, member of the family. Valuable, yes. Yes, valuable member of the church, of course. Valuable citizen of the country? Yes. Valuable in the sight of God. No doubt we're all of equal value in the sight of God. But if you're not very valuable to the marketplace, you don't get much money, you say, well, it shouldn't be that way. Well, then you've got to start your own country. You know, this one's been in process for 200 years, and this is the best we've been able to come up with so far. But here's the key. You don't have to stay. You know, there was a big debate in Congress. Well, last year that this $5 was not enough. Should be six, should be six, should be six, should be six, but we don't need legislation. Six is already on this ladder. The next step up, you know, if you work for McDonald's, they'll pay you $5 an hour to take out the trash. If you whistle while you take out the trash, they'll pay you $6 an hour. So we don't need that legislation. You need, just need to take lessons on how to whistle. 
You have a good attitude now as you begin to climb this ladder. Why would the marketplace pay some people $50? Zero an hour. Answer, evidently they must be more valuable to the marketplace. 10 times more valuable. And is that possible for someone to be 10 times more valuable and earn $50 an hour instead of five? And the answer is yes. That's what America is all about. Now, why would the marketplace pay some people $500? Zero an hour. Evidently, this person must be much more valuable to the marketplace. That's, the, that's what's important to understand to the marketplace. And would the marketplace pay one person $80, a million dollars for one year's work? And the answer is, of course, if you helped a company make a billion dollars, would they pay you 80 million? I'm telling you it is possible. And that's why America is so exciting. That's why this financial ladder is so exciting. It's possible for all of this to come true for all of you. No matter where you start as a student in school. Just getting started out there in the workplace, this is all possible. For you other ways to become valuable to your family, valuable to your friends, valuable to the community, valuable to the team, right? Valuable to the, to the team effort, valuable to the concert. But here's what he said to me, in climbing this ladder economically, all you have to do is work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Once I heard that, it made sense to me. I kept hoping that everything else would change around me. Found out that if I went to work on myself, worked on my skills, worked on my language, if I became better than I was. Each year, if I grew in skills and language and vocabulary and competence, then I would become attractive to the marketplace. Not very long ago, a company called me and said, Mr. Owen, we're expanding internationally. So we'd like to have a bit of your expertise to help us. Would you give us a bit of your time? We'll add some millions to your fortune. And I said, okay. And I thought later, isn't that interesting? They would call me. Then my second thought was, of course, they'd call me. Who else would they call? I can get the job done now. What a contrast for me. Farm boy from Idaho, raised in obscurity, parents of modest means broke. When I was 25, how come I would get a telephone call? Someone offered me a lot of money to help them in expanding around the world. Simple answer. Evidently, something happened to me between age 25 and where I am today, and I can tell you where. It all started from my teacher, Mr. Shoff, who said to me, we, uh, we don't have to change what's going on out there. That's the wind that's blowing all. We have to do is change what's going on in here, and now there's several. Ways to do that on personal development, and, and let me give you those ways. Here's the first one we must learn from. Personal experience, pretty simple. Learn from what happens to you. Take a look back over the last few months. Did you make some mistakes? Uh, how could you correct those for the future? Take a look back over the last year. Have you done it right or done it wrong? Let's correct it for the next year. Learn from your personal experience. Uh, Mr. Schulf asked me when I first met him, he said, Mr. Roan, how are you doing? You've been out there now six years, and I said, I'm not doing very well. He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a simple, swift analysis to my situation. He said, if you keep doing it, the next six years will be like the last six. You don't want that to happen. Let's make the changes. So learn from your personal experience. Now here's number two, why I came to share this video experience with you today, and that, I'll call it Ope Other People's Experiences. That's me, other people. That's your teacher, other people. That's your friends and colleagues. Other people, the people you meet that can pass along to you. Their experiences, what's happened to them, the mistakes they made, how they corrected them, how they changed their health and changed their bank account and changed their income and changed their future. That's it. Other people. Now, there's two kinds of people to learn. From one is failures. Failures don't give seminars, right? That would be valuable. Bring your notebook. Have them tell you how they lost it all and threw it all. Away threw their health away and threw their friendships away and things didn't work out well. That would be valuable. But now then we must also learn from positive people that have done well. They've got the health. And so we ask them, how did you become so healthy? They've got the skills. So we ask them, how did you become this skillful? They got the income. So we ask them, how did you get here in such a short period of time? So now here's what's important in personal development and learning from other people. We learn number one by observation. We learn what we see. Uh, we watch people that are successful in what they do. In sports, we watch their disciplines. In business, we watch their disciplines. 
by observation what we can see. Uh, the reason I created this video is something that you could see someone's experience is translated for you. Second, we learn by. What we hear, I've got some of my lectures on cassette tape, so you know you can take them with you wherever you go and learn by listening. Turn your car into a, a mobile classroom and listen. And then listen to the sermon on Sunday morning. Listen to the lectures, listen to the teacher, listen to someone who's got something good to say, and then number. Three is vitally important on personal development and that is read all the books, all of the books you can possibly read in your lifetime. Mr. Shof got me started on my library. I've got one of the better libraries. You haven't read everything in it, but uh, feel smarter just walking in it by library. Reading the books, attending the classes, making sure that I got in front of people that had something good to say. And then I started keeping a journal. One of the major things my teacher taught me was to keep a journal. He said, don't trust your memory. If you hear something good, just make a little note and write it down. Now, at first I took, you know, notes on pieces of paper and torn off corners and backs of old envelopes. And it didn't serve me well, you know, thrown in a drawer. And I learned to keep a journal, a bound copy of all my notes. So I would suggest you do the same things that impress you. A poem that impresses you when you attend a class. Some of the ideas that impressed you, jot them down. You read something in a magazine, right? Some ideas. Take those out, put them in your journal. Keep a good journal the rest of your life. This will serve you well. My journals make up a significant portion of my own library. And if you saw my library and saw my journals, I tell you what. You have to say, this is the library and these are the journals of a very uh, serious student. Uh, no wonder Mr. Rowan is invited to lecture and speak on his experiences around the world. So I want the same thing to happen to you, value captured that you can resort. So later, go back over it and review it and let it become valuable to you. So that's my first subject, personal development. Work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Develop the skills, learn the lessons, take the classes, absorb all that is being taught to you these days. And then later on, of course, you can sort it out. What's valuable to you and how to refine it for your business and for your life and for your future. But the main thing is to get it and start this process of personal change, personal development. And let me say it one more time. If you will change, everything will change for you. You'll never be the same. You'll keep growing as you look back on a few months, look back on a few years. You won't believe the progress you can make economically, your relationship with your family, your friends, and whether you're in sports or economics or whatever, I'm telling you. That whole process of committing yourself for personal change, personal value, can really make your life unique and worthwhile. Now setting goals. Let me show you something to turn me every way, but loose I've never. Uh, been the same since I found out about it, learning how to set goals. Not long after I met Mr. Show, we're having breakfast one morning, Mr. I said, Mr. Rowan, now that we've gotten acquainted, we know each other fairly well, he said. But, oh, maybe one of the best ways I can help you. He said, let me see your current. Take it, list of goals, let's go over them and talk about it. And I said, what I don't have a list, he said, well, Mr. Ron, if you don't have a list of your goals, he said, I can guess your bank balance within a few hundred dollars, which he did. And, and that got my attention. I said, you mean my bank balance would change if I had all the list of goals? He said, drastically. So that day I became a student of setting goals. And I've used it to dynamically affect my life. I taught it to some of my business colleagues. We use it to do business around the world, setting goals. It can turn out to be a drama for your life. Here's what goals are your vision of the future. Uh, your vision of the future. Now there's uh, two ways to face the future. One with apprehension, two with anticipation. Guess how most people face the future with apprehension. Why? major reason why they don't have it well designed. They've left the design of their future to somebody else. And if you don't make plans of your own, guess what? You'll probably fall into someone else's plans. Guess what someone else may have planned for you? Not much. If all of your negative relatives all turn positive, what will that do for your future? Not much. If prices come down a little, what will that do for your future? Not much. If the economy gets a little better, what will that do for your future? Not much. If circumstances get a little better, what will that do? Not much. If the uh, weather gets a little better over the next few years, that'll do. Not much. I mean, you can go right down this whole scenario list. 
not most people all their lives. With their fingers crossed, count on this, not much. That's why 10 years from now, they'll be driving what they don't want to drive. Living where they don't want to live, wearing what they don't want to wear, doing what they don't want to do. Having what they don't want to have maybe become what they didn't want to become. It all starts by counting on something that's not going to count much. You say, well, then how can my life dramatically change? You got to count on yourself. And here's one of the things you got to count on your ability to design the future. It's called the promise. And the promise of the future, if you'll design it well, can have an awesome effect on your life. But if you face the future with apprehension, you'll take hesitant steps all day, uncertain steps all day. If you take uncertain steps all day for six years, you can imagine how empty your life can be. We've got to help our kids with the promise of the future. Now here's what's connected to the promise, the price, the price to pay. But I'm telling you the price is easy if the promise is clear. One of the better notes to make for today, the price is easy if the promise is clear and powerful. But the price seems almost too much to pay. Too much to get over or too much to accomplish if the promise isn't clear, if the promise isn't. Powerful, I'm telling you. Kids will pay the disciplines if they can see the promise. One of our biggest challenges as parents in the 90s is to help our kids see the promise of the future. That's why I'm teaching financial independence. How to become wealthy and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and unique. All of the stuff kids would hope to go. For it's all possible, this is America. That's the promise of the future, the price. A few simple disciplines practiced every day. And I'm telling you, the kids will pay the price of the simple disciplines if they can. Say the promise of the future. Uh, but if they can't see, they don't want to pay. And the same is true of all of us. We will pay the most extraordinary disciplines if we can see the promise of the future called setting goals. So I'm asking you to get a handle on the future. Uh, I'm asking you not to leave it to anyone else, not don't leave it to the company. Companies got their own goals. I'm asking you to set your own goals, your personal goals. Income goals and financial goals and health goals and spiritual goals and where do you want to go? And what do you want to do? And what do you want to see? And what do you want to be? That's it. Promise of the future. Design your own future. It's within your hands and your uh, capacity to do so. Here's how simple now goal setting is. It's not mysterious. You don't have to anchor. You don't have to focus. You don't have to visualize. No, that's here's how simple goal setting is. Change my life. Decide what you want and write it down. I mean, that's how profound this stuff is. Decide what you want and write it down. Make a list. Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you want to see? What do you want to see? What do you want to be? What do you want to have? What do you want to share? What projects would you like to support? What would you like to be known for? Uh, what skills would you like to learn? Some extraordinary things you'd like to do. Ordinary things you'd like to do right. Silly little things you'd like to do. Very important. Things you'd like to do. Decide. Decide on all that stuff and write it down. Write it down. Write it down. That's how simple this stuff is. And it's your own private. List if it's really private. You know, on your list, put some stuff in code. And nobody can understand it. If this lift fell into unfriendly hands and simple things, whatever, fools. Things doesn't matter. It's your list. Keep your list. If you, I keep my list in my journal so that I can go back five years ago. Here was my list and I'm a little embarrassed. Here's what I thought was so. Important now how my philosophy. That's changed from 10 years ago, five years ago, three years. Uh, go, here's my old list. Here's my new list. Here's what's valuable to me now. Here's what I want my life to be now. Here's where I want to go, what I want to do, what I want to see. Keep your list of goals so that it shows your growth. Shows your ability to change and grow. Your philosophy grows and expands what's valuable, setting goals. It doesn't matter how small foolish it is. Put it on your list. My Japanese friend, Turo Aikide, put on his first list a Caucasian gardener. Good morning. I thought that was good. I like that. Have you got this? Profound thing now and setting goals. Here's how profound it is. Decide what you want and write it down. Get together with your wife. Decide. Get together with your kids. Decide. Get together with your business colleagues. Decide. Decide. Write it down. Make a list. Okay, that's how easy it is. Now let me give you one more scenario on setting goals when I started making my first list, Mr. Shelf. 
said Mr. Owen. Looks like we're going to be together for a while, he said. I've got a suggestion for you, he said. Uh, I think one of the first goals you ought to set, you're 25. Year old American male, sure, you've made some mistakes, but now you're on the road to better. Things you got a family worth. It reasons makes the difference. And uh, he said, you've got every reason to do this. He said, why don't you among all the goals, you're going steady. He said, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? A millionaire. This is America, all the possibilities are available. Uh, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? He said, it's got a nice ring to it. Millionaire enough zeros to impress your accountant. Millionaire. And he said, here's why now I thought the uh, man doesn't need to teach me why. I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great to have one million dollars? He said, no, that's not it. Here's why. And I had one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, and I'm about to share it with you. This will be worth. The price of being here today, if you can capture what I'm about to share with you, babysitter fees, whatever else. You paid, some of you missed. Some sales today to be here. So this is a costly day for you. But what I'm about to share with you changed my whole life. Here's what Mr. Shelf said, set a goal to become a millionaire. And he said, here's why, for what it will make of you to achieve it. And I got one of the greatest. Classes in one sentence I've ever received in my life. Set a goal that'll make you stretch that far for what it will make of you to achieve it. What a brand new reason for setting goals. What an all-encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future. What for two? Uh, see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why the greatest value in life. Tell what you get the greatest. Value in life is what you become. Major question to ask on the job is not what am I getting here? That's not the major question. The major question to ask is what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable. It's what you become. That makes you valuable. So Shelf said, set A. Goal to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it then. He said, when you finally have become a millionaire now, he said, what's important is not the money. So I thought, wow, I've got some more to learn. He said, no, no, mister, and I'm telling you honestly, you could just give the money away now. I did better than that, right? I told you I lost it all. I'm rich by the time I'm 31. I'm a millionaire, I'm broke by the time I'm 33, so I didn't have to give it all away. I lost it all. Foolish mistakes I made that I'm a farm boy from Idaho. That early money drove me bonkers. I used to say, how many cut colors does it come in? I'll buy them all. I just went, I went crazy over that. First money, I just went crazy. And then I made that one foolish mistake, right? Continuing guarantee, I mean, you know, I'm so naive. Off the farm, I don't know. Look, continuing means and a few other mistakes. And by the time I'm 33, I'm broke. Now I've made and lost millions since then. But what an experience that was, and I'm telling you. Even the man was right. When I finally was broke at age 33, guess what I discovered? My money did not mean that much. It represented only a fraction of all my assets. Because they once you become a millionaire, Mr. Own, you can give all the money away because he says, uh, what's important is not the money. What's important is the person you've become what? A whole new concept on setting goals. Now there's two parts to this. And then we're wrapping up goals. Here's the first part now on this goal setting for what you become one. Don't set your goals too low. Interesting. We teach in leadership. Hey, you'll find it on the cassettes. Don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure's on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop, to read, to study, to develop skills. I belong to a small group. We do business around the world. You cannot believe the expectations at that level, what we expect of each other in terms of excellence far beyond average. Why? So that we can each grow so that we can receive from the group. We can contribute to the uh, group something unprecedented. It's called living at the summit go where the demands are high. Go where the expectations are. Strong so that it'll provoke you, push you. Uh, urgently insist that you not remain the same for the next couple of years, the next five years, that you'll grow and change. So don't set your goals too low. Uh, the guy says, well, I don't need much. Well, then you don't need to become much now. Here's the last part on setting goals. Don't compromise, don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early years that I paid too big a price for. 
if I'd have known how much it was going to cost, me, I never would have paid, but I didn't know. Don't sell out. Ancient phrase says, count the cost, count the cost, count the cost. An ancient story says, Judah's got the money. You say, well, that's a success. Story, no, no. It's true. 30 pieces of silver in those days was a sizable fortune, you say. Well, if a guy's got a fortune, right? That's a success. Story, no, you don't understand. His name was Judas. Doesn't that ring a bell? Judas, you say, oh, yes, Judas. Judas, the traitor. That's right. The traitor got the money. Doesn't that change the story? And the answer is, of course, it changes the story. Let me give you my best opinion. I get paid staggering money for my opinion, so please write it down, my opinion. Here's my opinion. Each person's philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. Each person's philosophy is the major factor in how your life works out. I want that to be as emphatic as possible because I truly believe it now up. Until I was 25, that would never have occurred to me that my personal philosophy was the major fact. If you would have known me when I was 25 years old, and you would have said, Jim Rohn, how come you find yourself here? This is pitiful. Living in America, you're broke. You got, and is in your pocket, you got nothing in the bank. Creditors are calling you behind on your big mouth promises to your family. You've been to at least one year of college. How come you find yourself in this pitiful position if you would have asked me that? Question, when I was 25, it never would have occurred to me to blame my philosophy. That would not have occurred to me. I would not have said to you, well, I got this lousy philosophy. What else would you expect? I mean, that, that would not have occurred to me. You don't jot those little phrases. Down should, could don't. Here's what we call that formula for disaster. And all you've got to do to start now, the process of life change. It starts somewhere, and it doesn't even matter where. You can start with good health or you. you. can start with something else. The key is to start by saying I'm going to start the process in each category. Uh, finding by my own research, and that's why. Uh, seminars are so valuable, that's why information is so valuable. That's why somebody willing to take the time to share is so valuable, just to help boil it down in some form to the half a dozen few things that takes care of most of it and then oh, let me get on with practicing it and where you start doesn't matter the process of life change can start with as simple a process is an apple a day which means I'm on the road to cleaning up neglect I'm gonna walk around the block I'm gonna get the next book of my new library I'm gonna get a journal she'll taught me to keep a journal he said don't just let ideas get by you don't. Trust your memory if you're serious about really becoming an entrepreneur, if you're serious about affecting other people's lives, if you're serious about fortune, if you're serious about wealth and health. If you're serious, start collecting ideas, go over them and review them. Uh, then make them a part of your life and practice and don't ever look back. That formula helped. Changed my life, brought me to where I am today. And I'm so delighted now to have the opportunity to go around the world telling the same story that I heard when I was 25 years old. There's a few basic things. And if you practice them every day, I'm telling you, there's no reason why you can't have the health you want, uh, the, the relationship you want, the fortune you want, the money you want, the income you want, the sophistication you want, the culture you want, the prestige you want, the influence you want. All of it, it's wrapped up. I think in a nutshell of what I've just explained to you a few things. Now, let me give you one more part of it. Here it is. Once you've found the few things that makes the most difference. Now, the most of your time working on those few things. That now is another part of the clue. The first part of the clue is to get the information and consistently practice it. But here's the rest of. The formula, spend most of your time on it. The reason why. A lot of people don't do that well is because they. Major and minor things. Uh, they spend too much time on things that don't count much. And they spend too little time on things that would count. Here's a guy in the last 10 years who's bought 2,000 donuts and two books and this guy says, you know, my life isn't working well. Well, anybody in this audience could give him a seminar, right? Once we knew these numbers, here's what we might suggest to this guy. Hey, this may be one of your major problems in the last 10 years you've spent. Too much money on donuts and not enough money on books. 
You spent too much money feeding the body and not enough money gathering food for the mind and it's not the miracle of your body that works out your future. It's the miracle uh, of your mind that if you nourish the body and neglect to nourish the mind. I'm telling you, you're going to have all kinds of problems and all kinds of difficulties, so we would suggest. One of our suggestions in our seminar to this man would be, in the next 10 years, spend a lot. Less money on donuts and a lot more money on books. Sued for thought, bread for the head, we call it. You've got to have ideas to feed your mind, not just your body. And the miracle of the mind is so fabulous to work out your future, to give you all the equities you could possibly hope for, to give you every dream and every treasure you could possibly want for you and your family and for the people you care most about. It's all available, but it is a very basic, simple process. Once you've found a few things, spend most of your time and money working on those few things. Okay, we call these basics basics, fundamentals. Um, another good word if you're going to play football, you got to learn the fundamentals and there's about how many there's? About a half to a dozen, right? It'll make you good at it if you practice those half a dozen. A few other things, yes, but the half a. Dozen are what's important to lay the groundwork. Basics. Fundamentals, now let's talk about the fundamentals of life. Let me give you this little series, to John 1 Fundamentals of Life 1. Uh, there's just a few. There's just a few fundamentals of life, about half a dozen, about half a dozen. Fundamentals of life, there's just a few. So here's number two, once you know them, you know them. I mean, there's nothing difficult here. It's pretty easy to figure out why people are broke, and it's pretty easy to figure out how people get rich. Just no big deal. Fundamentals of life one, there's just a few. Number two, once you know them, you know them. Now here's three, there's no new ones. Written history is what, about 6,000 years. There's nothing new here. Now, there might be a new way to say it. There might be a new way to apply it to the 20th century, getting ready for century 21, but this stuff is basic. It's old. It's fundamental. So be aware of somebody who comes along and says, we've got new truth. Say, no, you can't have new truth. Truth is old. So be a little suspicious. God, the guy says we're manufacturing antiques. You got to come watch our place. Wouldn't you be, wouldn't you be a little suspicious? You say, no, you can't manufacture antiques. Antiques are what old sold. Antiques are like truth. Truth is old now just because you've discovered it. There's no sign it's new. Say, no, truth is old. The, the fundamentals go way back. The fundamentals of sowing and reaping go way back. The fundamentals, good. Evil go way back. I mean, there's nothing new here. All we need to do, though, is to just bring our intellectual discovery process to bear and see if we can't find those few things, then the rest of it is to get. Busy practicing those few things, we might all agree on one philosophy. This is where the value of uh, human life begins to show versus all other life forms. I call it simply a guidance system, settling on certain questions and making decisions about what direction in life you're going to take. Setting goals, making plans. This guidance system, I uh, uh, boiled it down to each one's personal philosophy, a guidance system. And we all needed a guidance system for two reasons. For your notes, one to avoid the dangers, somebody's got to give us some clues first on how to avoid the dangers and two, to take advantage of the opportunities. To see and understand the opportunities, take advantage and to avoid the dangers. It's about as simple as I can put it, a guidance system necessary to do that while we listen. Two ideas, whether they come from me or from. If someone else be a collector of good ideas, get more serious about altering the course of your life and you can. Regardless of what happens the next five years, getting ready for the turn of the century, you can wind up where you want to be. The money, the joy, the pleasure, the satisfaction. A uh, set of sale. Now, what is philosophy if it's so important? I teach kids how to be rich by 4,035 if you're extra bright. Much sooner, if you find a unique opportunity, kids say, hey, that sounds good to me. How do I do it? And I say it starts with your philosophy. So kids ask me what is philosophy. It's kind of a big word. So I've broken it down for them, made it. Uh, easier for me to understand, here's my definition of philosophy. Philosophy comes from one, the collection of all that you know. Gathering knowledge is the first key to. Developing the philosophical set of sale. And then number two, deciding which of this information is valuable enough to bet your money and your time. That's about as simple as I can put it to change the set of sale regardless. Love the wind that blows. 
First you search for knowledge, then you've got to sort through it and decide which of it is valuable enough to spend money and time. That is one of the best equations I know of. You might know 1,000 things, but you can't do 1,000 things. But you've got to sort through a lot of information and boil it down to the things that really matter to you and utilize that as the most important pieces, deciding what's valuable. So first of all, we got to gather knowledge. When I have a chance to talk to my high school friends, the first thing I tell them is you got to have the information. Get it while you're here. Don't, don't leave school without it. It's one of my little phrases for my high school friends. Ah, what they teach here. What you think of it. That's up to you. What you're going to do with it, that'll. It won't be up to you. So, but right now, this is the important thing is to get it. You can sort through it. You can cast aside whatever is not going to work for you in the future. But the important thing is to be serious enough to get it. Okay? Teach them. There's nothing worse than being stupid, right? Being broke is bad to being stupid is what's bad, and what's really bad is being broke and stupid. Nothing much worse than that. Unless you're sick, right? Sick, broken, stupid, that's about A. Unless you're ugly, surely that would do it. Ugly, sick, broken, stupid, life's most negative scenario. So one you've got to know, you've got to have the information. Now where do we get? Ideas and information, we've got this marvelous ability here. Like Noah, the life form on Earth has to alter the course of our life. You don't have to keep flying as if South is not getting you the money. And the joy and the pleasure. Telling you can alter the course. You're not like just a blind animal that has to be driven by instinct in the genetic code. So if we want to change our life, we've just got to use. This marvelous mechanism to gather more ideas and information and see if it'll pay off for us. So where do we get this? We've got this. Down one from PE, call it personal experience, just make it a point from now on to learn more from your own personal experience. It's probably the best university in the world. For your own personal experience, you've been through enough that could teach you personal experience. A lot of the questions from your personal experience log. The answer is from your personal experience, right? Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. And here's where it can all. It's our Paying more attention to your own personal experience. One way to learn to do it right is what do it? Wrong. That's one way to learn. Now the key is, don't let it take too long. If you've done it wrong for 10 years, we suggest that's long enough. We don't suggest 10 more years just to prove. A point. Now you can prove any point in 10 years. In 10 years, your health disciplines will be on track or what off track. Your financial independence will be on track or off track. It doesn't take that long to come to the conclusion based on your own personal experience. Uh, whether you're on track or off track in a few years, you've either got the breath or you haven't got the breath. You got the money or you haven't got the money. You've got the self-esteem or you haven't got the self-esteem. I mean, it doesn't take much from your personal experience. Shelf was swift to point out my personal experience said, let's learn from that. He said, Mr. Owen, you've been working six years. I said, yes, sir. He said, how are you doing? I said, not very, what up? He said, I suggest you not do that anymore. What a swift analysis of my current situation. He said, couldn't we find out what happened the last six years so that you can alter the course the next six years that it never occurred? To me, he said, I'm telling you, we can learn so much from the last six that we can make the next six years totally be different than the last six. And that's exactly what he did for me. That second six years, my life so swiftly changed. It was absolutely incredible. Uh, age 25, I was broke. At age 31, I was rich. And he said, Mr. Owen, if you'll make these changes starting today, he said, the next six years of your life will be totally different than the last six. I took him up on that. So now let me give you that promise in case you have to leave early. Here's a promise that changed my life for your notes. He said, if you will change, everything will change. For you, if you will change, everything will change for you. All leaders must learn the basic laws so they can use them as illustrations as well as use them for productivity. Here's the first of the basic laws. Whatever you sow, you reap. Now here's another way to put it on the positive side. In order to reap, you must sow. Reaping is reserved for those who sow, who plant. To deserve the harvest, you must plant the seed. Take care of it in the summer. 
carefully harvest it and then do wise things with the harvest. Here's the rest of the law of sowing and reaping. If you sow good, you reap good. If you sow bad, you reap bad. You can't sow bad and hope for good. You can't plant weeds and hope for flowers. It works both positive and negative. Now, here's something else about the law of sowing and reaping. You don't reap what you sow. That's important to understand. You reap much more than what you sow. If you just reap what you sow, what's the exercise for? No, we don't reap what we sow. We reap much more than what we sow. Now, here's what's important to understand on that. It works both positive and negative. The old prophet said, if you sow to the wind, you don't reap a wind. You reap a whirlwind. You've got to be careful sowing to the wind. It doesn't come back as a wind. It comes back as a whirlwind. That's on the negative side. But now it also works on the positive side. If you plant a cup of corn, how much do you get back? A cup? No, a bushel for the cup. You get back much more than what you plant. That's the reason for planting, for the increase. Positive, negative. Now here's the next key to the law of sowing and reaping. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Everybody has to understand. The farmer plants the crop in the spring, takes care of it all summer, is an honorable man, loves his family, is a decent citizen. But the day before he sends the combines into the field, a hailstorm comes along and beats his crop into the ground and it's gone, it's lost. So this time it didn't work. So now what must the farmer do? He's got to decide whether to do it again or not. Shall we take another chance in the next spring? We would advise him to do so even though he lost everything in the last harvest. And it didn't work. You didn't reap what you sowed. But here's the law of averages. Here's the odds. More often than not, you reap what you sow. More often than not, you'll have a harvest if you plant in the spring. There's no guarantee, but more often than not. And guess what more often than not is? Pretty good odds. It's better than Las Vegas. The law of sowing and reaping. Next, one of the most important laws to learn is the law of averages. If you do something often enough, you'll get a ratio of results. Once you understand that, you know, the world is yours. Learning to employ people in the unique thing called the law of averages is stunning in its result in terms of fortune. Let's say you're in sales and you talk to 10 people just getting started. If you talk to 10, you get one. We now have what we call the beginning of a ratio. Talk to 10, nine say no, one says yes. I'll buy your product, I'll take your service. Somebody says, well, one out of 10 isn't that good. Well, you're just getting started. Because here's what happens with the law of averages. Once it starts, it tends to continue. If you talk to 10 and get one, chance is excellent. If you talk to 10 more, you'll get another one. In baseball, we call it batting average. Swing 10 times, get a hit. Swing 10 times, get a hit. Nobody bats nine out of 10. You don't have to be perfect here. All you have to do is understand the law of averages. Now, even if you're only getting one out of 10, you can now start to compete. If you've been here a long time, you can get nine out of 10. I just joined, I can only get one out of 10. I'm telling you, if we have a contest, I will beat you. Say, well, you're just started, how could you beat me? It's very simple. If we have a 30 day run on a contest or a 60 day run, while you talk to 10 and get nine, I will talk to 100 and get 10, I win. Isn't that clever? Here's what I do if I'm new. I make up in numbers what I lack in skill. I make up in numbers what I first lack in skill. Now, when my skills increase, I don't have to do 100 to get 10. Once you understand the law of averages, I'm telling you, it's so exciting to work with the law of averages. The law of averages works in our little money plan here. You know, chances are excellent if you have this little plan. I'm telling you, chances are excellent. It'll work, it'll work, it'll work. The ratios will work for you. Here's what else is exciting. The law of averages can be increased. At first, you only get one out of 10, but the better you get, the more skills you develop. Now you get two out of 10 and then three out of 10. And you don't need more than about two, three out of 10 to get rich. In working with people, there's a unique story about the law of averages. It says the sower went out to sow the seed. Number one, he had excellent seed or a great story to tell and a good product to sell. And it says the, the sower was ambitious, got up early in the morning and went out to do the deal. So good seed, ambitious sower, and he starts to sow the seed, but here's what happens. Make the notes. The first part of the seed that he sowed, the birds got, and the birds are gonna get some. John said, yes, I will come check out the meeting, see if that's an opportunity for me. He says, I will be there on Tuesday night. Tuesday night comes, John isn't there. I say, I wonder where he is. The birds, whatever form they come in. 
and he's not there. Somebody stole the seed. Somebody robbed him of the opportunity. Guess what you can do about it? Nothing? Well, you could chase birds, but I'm telling you, it's, a, it's not a good deal. You say, well, I'll get a hold of John, whoever talked him out of coming, I'll go straighten them out. I'm telling you, you've asked for more than you can handle. Here's what you should do. Here's what the sower did. He kept sowing the seed. Here's what you can do if you stay busy. Sow more than the birds can get. Just de depend on the law of averages. Not trying to straighten out every problem. So the birds are going to get some. Now it says he kept sowing the seed, and now the seed falls on rocky ground where the soil is shallow, and the little plant starts to grow, but the first hot day, it withers and dies. So make the note, the hot weather's going to get some. You recruit somebody and they join, say, hey, I'm going to really do great here. And two days later, somebody says, boo, and they quit the first hot day. Say, what can you do about that? Nothing. Because if you start chasing, trying to fix this, I'm telling you, it's unfixable. But here's what you can do to fix your future. Keep doing like the sower did. He kept on sowing. And you can't be responsible for the shallow ground. That's somebody else's responsibility. So here's the third key now. He's keep sowing the seed, and now the seed falls on thorny ground. And this time the little plant starts to grow again, but the thorns choke it to death, and it dies. So make the note, the thorns are gonna get some. Here's what it called the thorns in this little story. The cares of life, little duties, little distractions. I said, John, we had a meeting last night. How come you weren't here? John says, well, I can't make every meeting. I said, why not? He said, well, the screen door came off the hinges. You just can't let your house fall apart. You got to take time and fix, fix, fix. I can hear the thorns. He said, some extra trash piled up in the garage. You just can't let mountains of trash pile up in your garage. What can I do about that? People let little things cheat them out of big opportunities. And sometimes it's a little heartbreaking to watch, especially if it's somebody you care about. But there are some things, remember, you can't straighten out. You just got to depend on something else for your fortune and your future. But now let's go to the rest of the story. Here's what it says. Finally, the sower keeps sowing the seed. Now it falls on good ground. Underline this, good ground. And it always will. If you keep sharing a good idea, it will someday fall on good ground. Productive ground, receptive ground, decision-making ground. Now, it was interesting, though, about the ground. Here's what it said about the ground. Some of this good ground now produce 30%, some produce 60%, and some produce 100%. What's that called? The law of averages. Everybody's not gonna do the same. Everybody doesn't have the same ambitions. And you can't straighten this out now. You just have to take it like it comes. It's like the seasons. You can't rearrange them and say, I'll take two springs, three summers. No, you got to take them like they flow. But now how do you get 100 percenters? Some will produce 100%. How do you get some 100 percenters? You got to go through the birds and you got to go through the hot weather and you got to go through the choking thorns and you got to sort of put up with those, you know, that haven't got much ambition, 30, 60 percenters, and you'll get some 100 percenters. The law of averages is at work in the university. Are there as many seniors as there are freshmen? You say, why is that? It, it's a mystery. The inevitable erosion of life says there's always going to be more freshmen than seniors. Not every race that started does everybody finish. The answer is no. Some people don't want to finish. Some people plant in the spring and leave in the summer. And you can't straighten that out. Here's what you can do. Keep telling the story. Keep sharing a good idea. And I'm telling you, it will work for you. So here's what we say. If you want a lot of graduating seniors, you must keep loading the freshman class. The law of averages. It's one of the greatest studies to make. It'll serve you well in your business career, your sales career, any kind of career. One more on the law of averages. There's an old rule, and it's been around a long time, that says 20% of the people do 80% of the business and 80% do 20%. And this is something you don't try to change or rearrange. It's part of the deal. Somebody says, well, I'll just fire the 80%. Say no, because whoever's left, 20% of them will do 80% and 80 will do 20%. That's not something you mess with. Here's what these laws are. Something you work with, something you understand and you work with. 20 are going to do 80 and it works everywhere. Ask the minister of the church, who puts up the money here to support the church? He says 20% of the people pick up 80% of the tab and 80% pick up 20%. Americans paying taxes, what's the deal? 20% pay, 80% of the taxes, and 80% pay 
20% of the taxes to run the federal government. This is not something you mess with. This is something you work with till you understand it. Well, how do you work with the 80-20? Here's what you got to do. Part of it's time management. You can only give 20% of your time to the 80% because they're only producing 20%. Now you can give 80% of your time to the 20%. Now remember, the pull is in the opposite direction. Guess who wants 80% of your time? The wrong group. The wrong group. Now, not this is not a moral question. The wrong group in terms of productivity and effectiveness in your business, your future. So what's the answer to that? Here's part of the answer. You can work individually with the 20%, but you can only work by group with the 80%. However, guess who usually wants your individual time? The 80%, and you cannot do that. That's the law of averages. Here's the next important law, called the law of faith. We covered it a little bit earlier in a fairly simple form. Faith is the ability to see things that don't yet exist. Faith, though, can turn difficulty into reality, positive reality. And I just want to give you this quick little line up here because it's so important to ponder and, and then work it. Here's what faith is for. Number one, faith is the ability to see it as it is. Faith doesn't mind seeing it as it is because faith is a miracle worker. Faith does not ignore the negative. Faith uses the negative. Because if there was no negative, there'd be no need for faith. If everything is okay, what would you need faith for? You need faith because it isn't okay. Now, what isn't okay? Who knows? The situation that isn't okay isn't okay. So here's what faith does. Number one, faith does not ignore the negative because faith now stands as the miracle worker if you let it work. So faith sees it as it is. If it's ugly, it's ugly. If it isn't working, it isn't working. If it's a mess, it's a mess. It doesn't hurt to call a mess a mess. You don't need to fancy it up here. If it's broke, it's broke. If it's miserable, it's miserable. Faith doesn't mind admitting that. Faith doesn't mind seeing that. Here's why. Number one, you can see it as it is. That's the beginning of faith, seeing it as it is. Now, here's the second step of faith. See it better than it is. Couldn't you see beyond the mess? The mess is for today. Couldn't you look into tomorrow? The answer is yes, I guess I could look into tomorrow. Humans have this incredible ability to look into tomorrow, to look into next week. So we not only have the ability to see it as it is, the beginning of faith, but to see it better than it is. Dream the dreams, make the plans, visualize, use your imagination, see it better than it is. Now here's the third step that turns faith into reality. Make it better than it is. Faith now must be invested in the muscle. But if you invest faith now in the action, you can take any situation and make it better than it is. Next, in the beginning of faith, seeing it as it is. Don't see it worse than it is. Don't blow it out of proportion. Some people have this tendency to blow it all out of proportion. They say, well, it can't be that bad. If it's this bad, that's how bad it is. You don't need to multiply how bad it is by 10. That's not necessary here. Just as it is, that's the deal, as it is. Don't see it worse than it is. Now here's the next unique key to faith. Don't see it for more than it can become. There's a thin line between faith and folly. Yes, it's possible to see yourself as a millionaire, but not overnight. Somebody says, well, yes, I can see that. Don't see it for more than it can become in a reasonable period of time. Yes, if it dropped out of the sky overnight, but that's not likely. But it's still possible to be a millionaire. It's still possible to be rich and wealthy given a certain amount of time working with the law of averages and all the rest of the stuff we've talked about today. So don't see it for more than it can become so that you move into folly instead of faith. Plenty is possible without being foolish in your faith exercise. But now here's two more cautions. Number one, it might be worse than you first see it. You better look underneath. Because sometimes you just look at the surface. You better take a look. So that you can really see it as bad as it is. Not to overblow it now, but to make sure you see it as bad as it really is. Now here's the next one. 
give yourself a chance to understand that it could be far more in the future than what you can first see. By faith, here's all you can see. The miracles that we see here gives us a certain amount of faith, but it looks like we need some more, we need some more. But you take the first step, take the first step of what you can see, but give yourself a chance to be able to see it for more than what you first see. it. On a foggy night, if all you can see is 100 feet, here's what you do. Walk that first 100 feet, now you can see another 100 feet. You can't see the 200 feet. But if you can see 100 feet, you walk the first 100 feet, now you can see another 100 feet. So I'm asking you to take the early steps of faith, whatever you can see it possible to become, start believing that, have faith for that. And I'm telling you, as that starts to exercise, you'll be able to see it for more and for more and for more. The possibilities will start to increase in your own imagination. The law of use. And it goes something like this. Whatever you don't use, you lose. Lack of use causes loss on this planet. Maybe not the next one, but on this one. If you tie your arm to your body, leave it there long enough, you'll never use it again. It's over for the arm. Now, it may not be over, but it's over for the arm. The only way to keep the use of this arm is what? Keep using it. If you quit, you lose automatically. They don't bring it up for a vote. You lose automatically when you quit. Now, the same thing that goes for your arm goes for your brain, mentality. The same thing goes for all the human virtues. Ambition, unused, declines. Strong feelings, unused, diminish. It doesn't grow, it diminishes. Faith, unused, decreases. It's a law. Vitality unused diminishes. Energy unused decreases. The guy says, well, I'm going to save up my energy. You can't do that. That's like trying to save today, put it on the end of the year. See, you can't do that. They'll come take you away. If you don't use today, what? It's lost. The guy says, well, I'll work twice as hard tomorrow to make up for it. See, that's foolish. You could have done that anyway. Today unused is lost. A talent unused is lost. An ability unused is lost. So here's one of the key expressions of the evening. Take a new inventory of yourself. Starting tomorrow, new project. Take a new inventory. And make sure that all of your talent and ability and mentality and ingenuity and vitality and strong feelings, faith, courage, make sure that all you've got is being used. Otherwise, you lose. Now, one of the best illustrations of the law of use is a Bible story called the parable of the talents. The talents story. Interesting story if you haven't read it in a while. Just review it. It's a good story. An ancient story it says there was a master with three servants. He got them together one day and he said to the three, I've got these talents. And in those ancient days, a talent was a measure of gold. And he said to the three servants, take these talents and see what you can do with them while I'm gone. He said, I'm taking a journey and I'll be gone for a while. When I come back, we'll get together, go over the book, see how you did. He said, here's five of these talents for you. Five. Here's two of them for you. Two. And here's one for you. One. The master said, take those talents, see what you can do with them. When I come back, we'll get together, we'll go over it all. The servant said, okay, master takes off. According to the ancient story, the master comes back from his trip. When he gets back, he gets the three servants together. And as he said he would, he asks, how did it go with those talents? You're five. What happened? That servant said, well, I took the five talents you gave me and I put them to work. A little shaky at first, but he said things finally got rolling. And he said, I poured it on. And he said, my talents grew to seven, eight, nine, ten. He said, I doubled my talents from five to 10. Books will show. Master said, one heck of a job or something like that. He said, I gave you two talents. What happened? That servant said about the same thing happened to me. I put those two talents to work, poured it on. They grew to three and then to four. He said, I doubled my talents from two to four. Books will show. Master said, well done. 
He said, I gave you one talent. What happened? That servant said, well, I took the talent you gave me and I carefully wrapped it and I dug a hole and buried it and camouflaged it, I suppose, right? so nobody would steal it. And he said, fortunately, nobody got it. And he said, I knew you were going to be here today, so I dug it up. Here it is, safely wrapped. I did not lose it while you were gone. According to the ancient story, the master said, take that talent away from him and give it to the man that's got 10. Now you might say, well, I don't like that arrangement. The poor guy's only got one talent. He's already got 10. It ought to be more even. Remember, I didn't ask you to like it, but this one I would ask you to learn because it simply means whatever you do not employ, you forfeit. It's a law. So learn well the law of use. Let's get through these now four steps to success. Number one was gathering good ideas, good health ideas, good business ideas, time management ideas, leadership ideas. But second, you need good plans, plans to achieve. Ideas gather dust, you know, they don't produce at all by themselves. It's like philosophy is not the end, philosophy is the beginning. Philosophy must be invested. And if you invest philosophy and attitude in disciplines, then they produce results. Here's a good phrase, wisdom uninvested in labor is wasted. Attitude, even the highest of attitude, which is faith. Faith uninvested is wasted, produces nothing. So the name of the game is not faith. The name of the game is not philosophy. The name of the game is to put faith and philosophy into activity so that it starts making progress. How do you turn nothing into something? Here's how you start. There's three steps to it. Number one, imagination and try to imagine yourself in those new, worthwhile, unique positions. So imagination starts to change everything. Now imagination is not tangible, but it is almost real. Almost real. It's not real, but it's almost real. But it's hard to say that imagination is nothing, but it's nothing in terms of tangible. It's not, it's not tangible yet, but it is the beginning of turning nothing into something. It's the beginning of turning nothing into reality, imagination. Imagination is the ability to see things that don't yet exist. Imagination is real in the sense that it affects. It'll affect your behavior, it'll affect your enthusiasm, it'll affect your emotions. It's real in that sense, but it's not real in the tangible sense. But to turn nothing into something, you start with imagination. Next is faith, to believe that what you imagine is possible. How would we start to strengthen our belief in that what we imagine is possible to turn it into reality? And there's two or three ways. One is to believe your own testimony. If you've done it before, why couldn't you do it again? If you've done it once, couldn't you do it the second time? Why not believe in your own testimonial? If I did it before, I can do it again. I was rich by age 31 and broke by age 33. But now my question was, could I do it again? And the answer was, yes, of course. You know, I lost the money, but I didn't lose the skills. And that's what's important about personal development. You can lose the money, but not the skills. So who cares about the money? Unless it's getting late and you're like 90 and you know it's a little difficult to go back to the streets but hey once you've got the skills you own the skills it's like sales a skill is more valuable than a sale someone sometimes a salesperson says i need a sale said no you need a skill sales are temporary skills are permanent so we start with imagination which is almost real i mean it's it's not real yet it's not tangible yet but it's almost real now we move to faith to believe that what we imagine is possible. So we study our own testimony. If we've done it before, we can do it again. Here's what else we study. Other testimonials of somebody who did it. Somebody that built a hotel said, yes, I started with some plans and finally believed it was possible, and here it is. Say, well, if it's possible for one, it's possible for another. In fact, sometimes when we hear the testimonial, here's how they finish. If I can do it, you can do it. See, that that's a classic testimonial that gives us now what we call faith and one of the ancient writers said faith is generated by what we hear 
the vocabulary of what we hear, the vocabulary of what we read, that generates faith to believe that it's possible. Now, faith is not reality. You can't say faith is nothing because it affects. It's like radiation. To us, it's nothing because it can't be seen. But radiation is so powerful, it can kill you. Right? You can't see it, but it has an incredible effect. And that's true of faith. Faith can't be seen right, with the natural eye. It can't be seen, but it has an incredible effect on your attitude, on your behavior, on your disciplines, on your work for the day, and all the rest. So faith is tangible in that sense, that it affects the emotions, it affects the drive. But we still don't have a hotel. Even though the imagination is very powerful and even though faith is very real, we still don't have a hotel because faith is not a hotel. Now it's almost, it is so close. Here's what one writer described faith. Faith is a substance, a substance of hope. It's not a substance like a brick being a piece of the hotel, but it's almost, it's so close, it's substance. And it, the writer also said it's so close, it's evidence. Now, not evidence you can see, but tangible evidence that's just as real as all of our human experiences that can't be touched, can't be seen. It's called the unseen magic. Language is the unseen magic. It can't be seen. The words can't be seen as they're transmitted from the speaker to the one who listens, but it can have a profound effect. That means it's more than nothing. Language is more than nothing. But to create something out of nothing, we start with imagination, then we move to faith, which believes it's possible, which is almost real. I built my first home in, for my family in Idaho many, many years ago. And before I started this home to construct it, I used to take my friends out to the vacant property. And I would take them on a tour through this house. Do you believe that? I could describe this whole uh, house with, in detail. Isn't that true though? Faith and imagination is almost, it's called evidence and substance. Now it's still not tangible, but it's not far from tangible. But now here's what we do with faith and imagination. We deposit it in disciplines and activity. Because faith without the activity serves no useful purpose. Imagination without the activity to translate it into reality serves no purpose. But wisdom and faith deposited in activity creates reality. The reality of a career, the reality of a hotel that wasn't there. But you shouldn't start building the hotel until you have it finished. Is it possible to finish it before you start? And the answer is yes, it would be foolish to start unless you had it finished. Unique things to remember. Now, here's what now turns wisdom and faith into reality, and that's activity muscle. The labor, the work. Some people go for affirmations, but see that I do believe in affirmations, but here's the key on affirmations, and that is to affirm the truth. If you're broke, best thing to affirm is, I am broke. Something might be wrong with your philosophy, your policy, your plan, and your strategy. So, affirm, yes, but always affirm the truth. Here's what the old prophet said, the truth will set you free. Now, here's the freedom of the truth. Number one, freedom of the truth, to correct old errors in judgment. That's the freedom of the truth. Because if you don't speak the truth, then you're likely not to correct the errors in judgment. If something's wrong, but you say, hey, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. How are you going to correct the errors in judgment that made it wrong? See, you can't say it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, and finally it turns out to be fine. Say, no. The only way to go from wrong to fine is not by affirmation. The way to go from wrong to fine is to figure out where the errors in judgment were by speaking the truth. Something's wrong here. Finding out what's wrong, making the changes. Now it can go from wrong to fine. Here's a good phrase. Affirmation without discipline is the beginning of delusion. Now here's what else the truth does. First, it sets you free to correct old errors in judgment. Here's what else it does. Helps you to set up new, easy discipline to turn wrong into right, to turn lack into prosperity, to turn skepticism into faith. The final secret is discipline. But in order to turn wrong into right, we must speak the truth. Because only the truth will set you free. Free to correct an error in judgment. Because here's the formula for failure and here's the formula for success. The formula for failure, number one, a few errors in judgment repeated every day. We call that the formula for failure. Now, why would you repeat an error in judgment the second day? Reason, failure doesn't occur at the end of the first day. If it did, it would be helpful. 
because then you wouldn't do that anymore. But errors in judgment are so subtle because they don't usually show their results until for a while. But a few errors in judgment repeated every day, every day, every day, and sure enough, you're way off course. Now, here's all you got to do to turn that around. A few simple disciplines practiced every day starts to create success. Not at the end of the first day. The first day is the end of a new beginning. The first day. That you've started a new track. That you've started a new direction. So we must all speak the truth. So affirm the truth. Yes, affirm God is good. Yes, affirm life is full of possibilities. Yes, affirm all the truthful possibilities. But you don't need to try to trick yourself into saying something is okay when it isn't okay. Some people say every day in every way I'm getting better and better. And if that's not true, see, that, then that we call that delusion. If it's not true, if it is true, then it's wonderful, it's fabulous. We should celebrate. But if it's not true every day in every way I'm getting better and better. See, if that's not true, then it is an affirmation that's destructive. So just affirm the truth. The truth is I lack some skills to multiply my income by 10, which I wish to do in the future. I need to learn the skills, affirm that you don't have the skills, so that it'll drive you to get the skills because you want to multiply your income by 10. Yes, it is true, all things are possible to the believer. It is true, errors in judgment lead to devastation. We don't just need the truth, we need the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Here's what we don't need, delusion. You don't need delusion in order to try to make something out of nothing. All you need is this simple little formula to imagine because imagination is so powerful. It's the beginning of creating all things that we see. Then faith to believe it's possible. It says what? With faith, everything's possible. Without faith, nothing is possible. So that's a good study to make, creating faith to believe it's possible. But now we deposit faith and imagination into muscle, into discipline. Michelangelo was a genius, but it wasn't his genius that created this famous sculpture. But his genius was so strong and he believed in it so thoroughly that he picked up the chisel and the hammer. And it was the muscle and the chisel and the hammer that created the sculpture. And without the discipline, there would be no sculpture. But if you take your genius, if you take your ideas and your inspiration and your excitement and translate it into muscle, if you want good health, you can study every book there is and you can believe that it's possible to be healthy. But until you fall on the floor and start doing the push-ups, until you jog around the block, Right? And still you start working on your good health, working and laboring. Labor pains, we call it. And the mothers in the room would tell us what? It's a unique experience. But why would an upcoming potential mother be willing to put herself through a rather painful experience uh, of giving birth? Here's why. It creates new life. So add this to your repertoire of good ideas. New life only comes from labor. Now, some people try to create it with affirmation, but that doesn't work. New life only comes from labor. That's why we should devote most of our time to labor because it's the miracle creator. It says six days labor and one day rest. Don't get those numbers mixed up. And here's why. It isn't rest that creates the miracle. It's labor that creates the miracle. And you just go right down the list. Labor creates the miracle of a career. Labor creates the miracle of a hotel. Labor creates the miracle of a fortune. You can have plenty of miracle. You don't need to engage in delusion. You just engage in reality. And here's what's real. Imagination, supported by faith, invested in labor, works miracle. Right? The miracle of a relationship. The labor of my language produces the miracle of sight. Being able to see things you couldn't see before. If I labor well enough with the vocabulary and language that I've got, describing the value of my own ideas translated for you, maybe it'll help you to see something today, tomorrow, that you've never seen before. So the labor of my language, the work, and, and we call that miracle stuff. I don't know how it works. You don't need to know how it works. All you need is a simple analysis like this. But the labor takes the idea, supported by faith, translated into labor, and it starts producing all kinds of miracle. So now you can understand that you are a miracle worker. Would a miracle worker sleep late? I doubt it. Unique thing about genius, genius has no sense of time. It's amazing. If you could have met Michelangelo and, you know, you get there and it's like 11 o'clock, it's like midnight. And you said to Michelangelo, isn't it a little late? And Michelangelo would say, late, late, what is, what, what's this late? What does that mean, late? I don't understand, late. To a genius, it's not late. To the average person, it's getting late. But to a genius, it's not late. Because the genius is consumed by the finished product. 
and he devotes his imagination and his faith translated into muscle to produce the sculpture. Now you can do that with your health. Health is just as valuable as the sculpture that inspires the world. You know, your own education, your own future, your own career, your own relationships, uh, building a hotel, creating success, making a fortune. It's all part of the same scheme of imagination, faith supported by labor. And now all things are possible to those that believe. Now here's the next part of, of the success formula. Learning to handle the passing of time. Patience to let the seasons work their work. You can't hurry the spring. It, it does its work in its time. You can't rush the summer. It does its work in its time. You can't shorten the winter. It's going to be however long or difficult it's going to be. You just must have patience with the unfolding of things from the beginning to reality, from nothing to something. Just make the note, there's always a way. Guess what's more valuable than money and capital? Ingenuity. The greatest capital in the world is ingenuity. Figuring out a way. I'll find a way. I'll start with nothing and find a way to turn nothing into profit. How can you turn nothing into profit? You sell and buy instead of buy and sell. If you have to, now sure it's better. If somebody says, yes, I want it, if you got it, you say, I don't have it. But if you will give me your money for this product, I will go get it, bring it to you, make a small profit. If I do it often enough, then I'll have some inventory. But you don't need inventory. Here's the greatest inventory, the inventory of the mind, the inventory of the personality, right? That's the greatest capital. Money serves its purpose, but what's money without courage? What's money without determination? Not much, it's worthless. But ingenuity and courage and determination and faith and charisma, and personality. You got so much to invest besides your money. Make sure the money is the smallest part of your investment. Just a little money and a lot of courage. A little money and a whole lot of ingenuity and you can turn all kinds of nothing into something. Now, the patience of learning to handle the passing of time. Two things really wreck your chances for the future, impatience and greed. You got to learn to deal with both of those, to let things work out. Impatience. Here's the other one that's a killer, and that's greed. Contrary to the movie Wall Street, greed is not good. Greed is evil, must be dealt with, must be legislated against, lest some be tempted by greed. Here's what greed hopes for, something for nothing. Here's what greed hopes for, more than its share. Greed hopes for something at the expense of others. You say, well, then how can you truly grow and make a fortune? It's very easy. Legitimate ambition. Find a way to serve the many legitimately. And your ambition now can make you a fortune. You don't need greed to make a fortune. Here's what legitimate ambition wishes for. Something at the service of others. Legitimate an ambition doesn't need to rise only because someone else diminishes. Legitimate ambition hopes to rise by helping others to rise. But learning to handle the passing of time. Patience. Now here's one more step to success. The solving of problems. Business problems, family problems, personal problems, financial problems. Emotional problems, we've all got these unique challenges. But when it comes to problems, I found a good way to go after a problem. It's the old, you know, draw a line down the center of the page and state the problem over here. Here it is. Sometimes you gotta take some things out of your head and put it on paper. It's to state the problem, put it on paper. Said, I got this to deal with, I got this, I got this, I got this to deal with. Is that all of it? Say, well, no, there is a couple more things. Let's put it all out here. Because to come up here with the answers and solutions, we need to know really what the problem really is. You don't have to live in it. You don't have to dwell in it. You don't have to, you know, sit in it. But you do have to know it. Because you can't up, come up with good answers unless you know the whole problem. We don't gloss this over now. We, we go after this. What is the real problem? Now we come up with the answers. Now, there's three major questions to ask to solve most any problem. Number one, what could I do? No use going any further if you could solve it yourself. And it's good to get in the habit of seeing if you can come up with answers on your own. What could I do? And then just do a little what we call develop some working papers. I could do number one, number two, or number three. And then right away you say, I can see right now, and number three would take too long. Number two, I'm not sure. Number one, my first impression might be the best. What could I do? These working papers. Then if that doesn't do it, next is what could I read, right? Is there a book on this problem? Maybe someone else's wrestled with it and found a solution. Maybe I could check out the book. 
Here's author number one, two, number three. You say, well, number three is crazy. This guy's nuts. That's out. Well, maybe number one, number two. And you just, you just keep searching. Also, you might read your old journals. Maybe something you've recorded some time back has got an answer that you've skipped over and you go do a little research. And sure enough, it's in your own journals. What could I read? Now, if this doesn't work and this doesn't work, now you go to number three. Who could I ask? But don't go to number three now till you've really worked hard on number one and number two. Because you don't just need the answer to a, a problem. You need the answer muscle. You need the mental processes stirred. You need to learn the skill of solving problems to the best of your ability by yourself. By yourself and for yourself. But if, if that doesn't work, now don't hesitate to ask. But don't ask first. See if you can solve it first. Then you've got some working papers to take to whoever you ask. And you come to somebody and say, look, I've done this, I've done this, I've researched this, and I still haven't got the answer. Could you help me? You can't believe how much quick, easy help you will get if it's evident right up front that you have tried your best to help yourself. We're all willing to invest some of our answers and time in somebody that we think it's worth it because they've really struggled to try to find the answer. Now, if we can come up with it, wouldn't that be great? So ask, but don't ask first.